Australia is completely unprepared for the implications of climate change. We've spent the last 20, 25 years essentially pretending that we're prepared to seriously address it. But in reality, we have done virtually nothing. When the first Category 5 tropical revolving storm goes in over the Hunter Valley in New South Wales, it will blow the place to smithereens. We've never really articulated uh, in, a, in a key, succinct, strategic sense how climate change is impacting national security. We haven't articulated that to the Australian public. With climate risks mounting across the Asia-Pacific region, you are living here in Disaster Alley. Climate change and its impacts will make North Korea look like a minor speck of history. I never imagined that we'd uh, face a serious risk of a war in our part of the world uh, in my lifetime. I mean, we have huge exposures. These are very serious risks of significant existential risk to the future of the planet and to the future of humanity. This is not a military problem in and of itself. This is the whole of society, whole of government. This is everybody's problem. In any high-risk situation, but particularly with existential risk, it's impossible to come up with the right solutions unless you first very clearly articulate the problem itself. And that is what we've not been doing. What climate change is doing is attacking the basics of human existence. It's attacking stability in the weather systems, it's attacking land availability, it's attacking food supplies. All of these factors come together. When they interact, you end up with a, an accelerating process where the problems escalate extremely rapidly. Sometimes it's hard for us to envision a future that's very different from the world in which we live today. We sometimes are at risk of thinking that all of the changes will be gradual. And with the climate changing so rapidly, but it's quite possible, uh, indeed even likely, given what we know, that we could see climate effects beyond the scale that they are occurring today. So we risk a failure of imagination if we don't take a look at how the world could be different tomorrow. The Australian Defence Force has been missing in action on climate change. Uh, there are no real genuine policies uh, in place to deal strategically uh, with the issue of climate change from a national security perspective. Consider, for example, uh, if we were to have a extreme weather event in the South Pacific, maybe we were to have two in future scenarios. How does the ADF actually respond to those two simultaneous events? The military often call this the risk of simultaneity, the ability for the Australian Defence Force to respond to multiple events. Well, climate change poses such scenarios. If this was to happen in the South Pacific is one thing, but what if that was to simultaneously occur in Australia, where the Australian Defence Force is increasingly being called upon to Australian emergency relief situations? The floods in Queensland, the fires in Victoria, increasing levels of drought, cyclones and so forth, uh, all these are real scenarios that the ADF going forward will have to deal with, potentially, multiple locations at the same time. When you sit back and look at the totality of it, we are going to rapidly get to a point where our ability to cope will far exceed anything the military could ever do. There's a physical limit that we will not go beyond. The Department of Defence is probably, if not the biggest, uh, landowner and infrastructure owner in Australia. It's got hundreds of buildings dispersed uh, across the continent. Darwin, Townsville, Perth, everywhere has a major defence installation. 
Now, many of these are at sea level. The Navy has umpteenth bases, uh, obviously right on sea level. The Air Force as well has air bases at sea level. The Army has bases along coastlines. One of the impacts, obviously, is sea level rise, sea level inundation on military bases. And this is not small fry as well. These are very expensive, long-term installations that when they are impacted by sea level rise, will require significant change as to the built infrastructure, if not relocation. These changing conditions are changing the way in which the Australian Defence Force can actually train and operate on its own basis. The scale of impact of climate that then flows through to economy, to food production, to energy, to the ability to actually trade with each other, that makes our current security issues look quite minor. If China had a major effect from climate change that significantly affected its economy and its ability of its people, we're talking about a massive disruption which affects our economy straight away. I think the risks of China getting to difficult economic circumstances are very real. They are an economic powerhouse, a political powerhouse. I mean, we're a big market for China and we're very heavily dependent on China. If their economic performance wanes, as I fear it might, and a country like Australia that's so heavily dependent on China uh, is, uh, is really at risk. If these things start to cascade and fail, the very way our economy functions, the way our society functions, will also start to fail. That's an existential threat. The threat to us in our region is way beyond what we currently conceive in terms of military threats. It's the threat to our way of life. Instability becomes the term that we use in connection with climate change consequences. But instability means people getting angry and doing something about it. The issue of the Himalayan glacier is of course important to the countries that surround, and by that I mean China, India, Pakistan, Bangladesh, Burma, the Mekong River and all the countries along it. If that source of fresh water disappears, all those countries will now be relying on either the monsoon or rainfall patterns to secure fresh water. The high likelihood is there will be insufficient fresh water to look after and provide food and water and succour for the seven and a half billion people that are going to live in those areas. Where will people go when they're starving? Where will people go when they're dying of thirst? Where will parents take their children? From a security perspective, trying to deal with numbers like that is mission impossible. Frankly, I think this is a forecast of the second invasion of Australia. I mean, these people are going to be millions, tens of millions of people looking for a home. And uh, you need a realistic assessment of, of the magnitude of that risk. The whole concept of a nation state may actually start disappearing in many parts of the world. The sort of numbers you're talking about moving internationally could well be 150, 200 million people in the next two or three decades or so. Right now we have 65 million refugees, displaced people. And this is the greatest number by far since uh, at the end of World War II. This is a humanitarian crisis. It's literally costing lives and putting whole populations at risk. In Africa, we're seeing the profound impact of climate change right now. The prolonged droughts, the rains when they come, which are floods, the prolonged conflict, the millions of displaced people, both out of the Middle East and North Africa, many heading Europe's way, ultimately our way. These impacts aren't simply conflict or corruption or lack of democracy. These impacts, when you look at the root causes, come from climate change. We're responding to things on the ground shaping human existence that match what scientists say. This is a challenge which is an existential threat for Stable societies already, many are erupting for a stable future for the world as a whole. Simply putting up a barrier and running around with a few Navy ships and contract ships stopping people coming in boats might work today, 
It will not work in 10 or 15 years if what we anticipate with climate change happens. At the moment, I think we are almost a pariah in the region for a lack of doing anything serious to deal with climate change consequences. There's an element of politics in a lot of countries around the world that, that see climate as somebody else's problem, not going to happen on my watch, push it down the, kick it down the road, it'll be okay. As if you can wait to 2049 and solve the problem. You know, and you, you go in there and you suddenly reduce emissions and solve the problem. We've got to change behaviour of all levels of our society. We've got to change the institutional structures in economic terms. We've got to change the industrial base. In the Cold War, we spent billions of dollars of American GDP to deter and prevent a low probability but very high consequence event of the threat of a bolt out of the blue nuclear attack by the Soviet Union. Today, we face a threat in climate change that is higher probability and equally high consequence, and yet we are not addressing it with the same alarm and attention. If you're going offshore drilling for oil, when you construct an oil rig, you build it to handle the conditions you're expecting and you put in a much higher safety factor given the risks that are involved. You want that rig to survive. You don't want to accept a 50-50 chance that it might sink within the first six months of operation. In engineering, you're looking at risk in a very quantified way. What's the probability of a certain risk? And what's the consequence of the risk? If you get on a plane, you don't expect a 50-50 chance of getting there. You expect to be there with a 99.99% chance of success. You have to look at climate change in the same way. I mean, we cannot mess around with the future of civilization on the basis of a 50-50 chance of, uh, of us surviving. That's just nonsense. But that's what we're doing. We have to get a sense of reality. We know in this country that 26 to 28% reduction by 2030, given our carbon intensity of our, of our society, is nowhere near enough. Paris is, is, is certainly not the end. It's certainly not the beginning of the end, but maybe the end of the beginning. One of the big problems in the climate change debate in Australia is the lack of understanding at leadership level. There's the assumption that this is somehow something that can be handled with incremental change from our business as usual. Addressing existential risk is a fundamentally different level of response from anything that is being contemplated at the present time. We are going to have to move to some form of emergency response if we seriously want to address climate change. Any rational response to the scientific evidence would suggest that we should mobilise today with the utmost urgency to transform the economy inside a decade. This is no longer a long-term issue. There is no doubt we can respond uh, and we can do things that we can't imagine today. But the, the level of response we then need gets more and more dramatic every day. It's going to be a supranational mobilisation like nothing we have done in history. It's bigger than World War II. The only issue that matters is acceleration, acceleration of the response. So it's all about speed now. As we approach tipping points, as we approach the, the potential for collapse, then the speed with which we respond is going to be the defining issue in our success. Scale and speed is the only game in town in terms of stopping climate change. Investing in fossil fuels is like handing an AK-47 to your most sworn enemy. Why would you do that? Why would you build things that are only increasing the risk to national security? Absolutely nonsensical. On the one hand, you have coal-fired, fossil fuel-based investments that come with the overheads of creating and increasing the threat of climate change to national security and to human security. On the other hand, we have renewable energy systems that do not come with that risk. It's a no-brainer. You want to reduce the risks of climate change, decarbonise your economy. 
but that means we should stop burning all fossil fuels today. One thing you do learn from the military, there's no 100% certainty anything, but you have to act in an appropriate time frame. We now know that a two degrees heat temperature increase is not a safe target. We are in a very dangerous place now. We can't go on allowing short-term politics to dominate. We need to recognise that the real solution is not more military force. You need to give a level of certainty. You need to paint a picture so that they all come together to solve the problem. Decarbonisation is central. It's the central and first thing that needs to be done. I'm talking about the wholesale restructuring of the global economy inside a decade. Think of the thousands, tens of thousands, probably hundreds of thousands of jobs. You can make the case for emergency mobilisation just from its economic benefit. We have to find ways and means under which we can not just stop global emissions but draw down carbon from the atmosphere there's a lot of learning by doing to be done. We need to reverse climate change, not just manage increasing temperatures.